get through this, the cell stuff, we'll start the cardiovascular system, that's when you're going to have, uh, start your, uh, the lab portion of it. You got me? So you'd be cutting open a heart. I'm trying to get fresh cow hearts where you can actually see like a, what a fresh heart looks like. You got me? Yeah. They're too hard to rip open. I told you that the first day, right? No one was listening. Oh. Oh, that ain't my fault. Um, so, yeah, I'm, that's what we're going to do. And then um, I also told you to bring some Ritz crackers, too, because I told you everything tastes great when it sits on a Ritz. Remember that? Well, just so you know, I hate me, too. All right? So here we go. Better write this down. Ted, I'm not even playing. No, for real. Ready? Here we go. Watch. I drew this right before class. It's one of my best. You need to get this. Again, if I say something a million times, it's important. Watch. Different cells do different things. Is that correct? So in order to perform all the chemical reactions inside a liver cell, what performs all the chemical reactions inside a liver cell? What kind of proteins? Enzymes. Enzymes. Tell me you got that. You're with me. So liver cells are going to have different enzymes than kidney cells, right? We've established that. So are there a lot of chemicals in the blood? Yeah, I think there's at least three. And these chemicals that are floating around in your blood can influence can affect a liver cell or a kidney cell. Are you with me? But the only way that they can affect a particular cell is if embedded in their cell membrane, they have the receptor that matches the chemical. Th this is a huge concept. How many people follow in that? You got me? These receptors are primarily made of protein. And protein is made of amino acids chemically bonded together, right? We talked about this. What inside the cell tells the cell how to put together the amino acids to make the protein? That's beautiful, the DNA. So this is the real important part because we talked about this. Does every cell that has a nucleus that contains DNA, does it have all the genetic information, all the DNA to make all the proteins in the body? Yes. But does a liver cell ever want to make an enzyme that a kidney cell would use? No. So on the sections of DNA, there are sections that tell the cell how to put together a protein. What's that section of DNA called? That's beautiful. It's called a gene. Say yes. How, how many people? You, you, you're, you know this stuff. That's good. You wanna, later in the semester, when the weather gets nice, if you would teach so I could go golfing, I'll give you a swig off my Bayat Mountain Dew and this blue pen that doesn't work. Are you ready? All right, so do you want chemicals from the blood willy-nilly going into your cells? No. So to prevent that from happening, these chemicals from the blood, when they bind to a specific receptor on the cell, and you're not going to believe this, this is so crazy. The shape of the chemical and the receptor determine whether that chemical can bind there and influence it. Did you know that? You know it now. So watch. I'm making this up. There's a bunch of chemicals in the blood. This chemical right here 
can influence this liver cell. When this chemical from the blood binds to this protein receptor on the surface of a liver cell, it's going to tell the liver cell to start making a protein. At this point, who cares what the protein is? You, are you with me? So what kind of protein is a liver cell going to make? A liver protein. Say yes. So should a kidney cell ever produce a liver protein? No. So how do you guarantee that only this particular section of DNA, this gene, is going to be activated in a liver cell? How can you guarantee that? How can you guarantee it? Make sure that the liver uh, cell is the only one that has this receptor. Tell me you got that. So watch. Real smart people with tape and pocket protectors have figured out the different receptors on your cells. They have also figured out the chemicals that bind to those receptors. So if you want that cell to perform a particular function that it's not performing, you want to find the receptor that will make that function happen. And you give them a drug that stimulates that receptor. Or if that cell is doing too much of that reaction, you want to give them a drug that blocks that receptor. So the 90% of the drugs that people take for whatever disease work by either inhibiting or stimulating specific receptors. Say yes. That's why that's important. And if you don't get that idea into your head, right, then you will struggle with pharmacology. Then it will be horticulture, where you grow plants. I think that's horticulture. Say yeah. I explained that as simply as I could. How many people followed that? That's beautiful. So watch. Let's go through the cell. And I'm going to tell you exactly what I expect. Are you ready? Also, I made a video of this while I was eating dinner. Some of the words on the video are garbled because I was eating spinach. And it dribbled out. All on my computer, right here. <laughs> here we go. Watch. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a composite cell. If you printed this out, this cell is identical to the one that you have, except mine is in color. And the reason mine is in color and yours is in black and white is because I'm better than you. <laughs> Don't you think that? This I'm not joking about. During lab, I wear my lab coat, and I have my name on it. And when I do wear that, I'm definitely better than you. I'm better than everyone. Then. <laughs> All right, who says that? This is a composite cell. A composite cell has different features of all different cell types found in the body combined together. Let me simplify that even further. Not all cells have cilia. Not all cells have microvilli. As we go through each part of the cell, I will give you examples of where these are found inside the body. Tell me you got that. All right. So first of all, we talked about the cell membrane. I'm not going to go over that. The cell membrane pr protects the stuff that's inside the cell, intracellular, from the potential bad stuff in the blood. Right? And as we know, it's selectively permeable. Right? I'm done with that. Now, let's look here. As you move deeper into the cell, you are going to have the nucleus of the cell. What's inside the nucleus of all cells? DNA. And the DNA is the heredity molecule, right? And in this class, DNA tells your cell how to put together structural and functional proteins. Boom. That's all I need. Say yes. All right. Now, what do you eat? Yeah, watch. I never ask a hard question. 
If you think, yeah, that's a simple answer, say it. You eat food that is good for you. What does food contain? You were mouthing it over there. What is it? Carbs, fats, and protein. Ain't that right? Do you eat carb, fat, protein, people, carb, fat, and protein? Did you have, ever have leg of Aunt Bessie? No, so watch. You eat aminal, carb, fat, and protein, and plant carb, fat, and protein. Say yes. And inside the cell, you take the aminal carb, aminal fat, aminal protein, and plant protein, carb, fat, and you have to make it into people carb, people fat, and people protein. Say yes. So inside your cells, there has to be a place that builds people carb, people fat, and people protein. Are there places like that? Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have set it up like that. Here we go. You know what I found? Even though this thing is relatively light, it gives me a neck ache at the end of the day. Nobody cares. Here we go. So watch. Inside the cell, the vast majority of the cell is made of water. The watery part of the cell is called, can you see that? It's called the cytoplasm or cytosol, same thing. So these little organelles float around in the cytoplasm of the cell. Are you with me? So each one of these performs a specific function. So where you actually put together people protein is in this area of the cell. And this area of the cell is called what? Just read it. It's called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The reason it is called rough is that this is a bad part of the cell. You shouldn't go into the rough endoplasmic reticulum after dark. Watch. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is where you put the amino acids together to build your proteins. The reason it's called rough, you better write this down because I want this, is under a microscope there are these little balls called ribosomes. And the ribosomes are actually the workbench. It's the workbench where you actually physically put together the proteins. I spell bench, B-E-N-C-H, right? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> you following me so far? So think of the rough endoplasmic reticulum as your garage, and your workbench is where you put stuff together. So we got protein covered. <clears throat> what else we got to make? Got to make, well, how about fat? Because it's, and I'll do it in order, but you're right. You make people fat, people lipid, in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is that 55-year-old guy who goes to nightclubs trying to pick up younger women. They have the shirt that's unbuttoned down to here, and they have like a big medallion on and they wear leisure suits. And they wear Old Spice. <laughs> the reason it's smooth is because you don't have any ribosomes. Also, better write this down, better not pout. You make lipid here, fat, and you also store electrolytes there. Give me an example of electrolytes. Thanks. Very good. store electrolytes. So now we got the protein, we got the lipid. What's left? The carb. And where you make people carbs is in the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus, I don't know if you know this, have you been following uh, the news lately? No? In the 2016 Summer Olympics, the Golgi apparatus is going to be added as a new event. I 
got a 9.6 on the Golgi apparatus. I miss my landing. The Golgi apparatus makes people carbs. You better, I want this. It is also the Federal Express of the cell. Let me explain. What is cholesterol made out of? Uh, uh, uh. 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 Come on. We'll ju just start saying words. We'll get there. House, bell, button. <laughs> Thank you. It's made of a lipoprotein. Are you with me? So watch. What in your body makes cholesterol? I wrote it. A liver cell makes cholesterol. You got me? I'm just giving you an example here. Now follow me. So watch. If your cells need more cholesterol, a signal from the blood is going to bind to a receptor only found in a liver cell because what's the only organ that makes cholesterol? And when that chemical binds to that receptor, it's going to signal the DNA, hey, let's go make some cholesterol. Where do you put the protein portion of the cholesterol together? Where do you make the lipid portion? And then the protein from the rough Boom. And the lipid from the smooth meet at the Golgi apparatus. And the Golgi apparatus puts it together. Say yeah. Then, what does the Golgi apparatus do? It packages that cholesterol in a little secretory vesicle. Are you following me? It's a piece of the Golgi apparatus. So now you got cholesterol here. We'll say just C. Then it gets packaged in a little secretory vesicle. That secretory vesicle binds to the cell membrane, and through the process of exocytosis, it dumps it into the blood. Say yeah. So the, smooth, or the Golgi apparatus makes people carb, and it's the final staging area for cell product. So we'll put the cell product together, and smush it out into the blood through a secretory vesicle. Tell me you got that. You followed that. Okay, that's good. All right. All right. Now let's look at this guy here. This guy is called a mitochondrion. A mitochondrion, this will help you on your multiple guess, has its own DNA. So within a single cell, a single cell, if there is an increased demand to make energy in that cell, those mitochondrion can replicate themselves within that single cell. So if the cell requires to, you to make more energy, those mitochondria will replicate and you will have more mitochondria inside that cell. Okay, let me give you an example. You are a Joey bag of donuts, right? You sit on your fatty acid all day, and you have a certain number of mitochondria in your muscles. But you decide, you know what? I've got a New Year's resolution. I'm going to do two things. Number one, I'm going to read the textbook. That was already blown, huh? Number two, I'm going to start exercising. I'm going to go running. How you get more endurance is by increasing the number of mitochondria in your muscle cells. That's how it works. So by stressing your body with running, the cells, the mitochondria will divide and you'll make more mitochondria. So watch. If you look at a marathon runner and you look at a sprinter, as you move from the marathon runner to the sprinter, the muscle mass increases because the stronger you are, the faster you are, right? But marathon runners don't have to be fast. They got to run 26.2 miles, right? So they, those guys look anorexic. When they're running past, you shouldn't be giving them a glass of water. You should be giving them a cheeseburger. Here, buddy. 
You following that? And the difference between them and, a, and the sprinter is the number of mitochondria that they have floating around in their cells. Say yes. All right, so watch. You better write this is what I want. Inside the mitochondria, this is where you make energy. We'll talk about this a little bit. Aerobically. What does aerobic mean? Uh, lifting up a tree is not aerobic. Oh, say the opposite. With oxygen, right? So Jane Fonda and her aerobics. You know what I watched last night? Fast Times at Ridgemont High. The 80s dress was just awful. You had the big socks with the fluffy stuff on it. Everyone looked like Pat Benatar. Are you with me? That's where you make ATP, our energy, aerobically. Say yes. And you should write this down too. The best way to make energy inside your cells is aerobically. And when we get there, I'll explain that. All right. Hang on. Okay. Now, these guys here, what, uh, what are the two classes of protein? Nice. So these little proteins called microtubules, these form the framework. They are protein and they form the framework of the cell, right? Your house has a frame, right? How that frame is put together determines the shape of your house. Say yes. So these little microtubules form the framework of your cell. They're the structural component of your cell. Yeah. <clears throat> Here's looking up your old address. All right, ready? All right. One of the things that are uh, cell type that is found in the body is cilia. These cells are ciliated. And cilia can actually move. They can actually like form a wave. So the function of cilia is to actually move stuff. Uh, not so much in digestive. Uh, I'll show you if I can find it. Oh, hang on. I had all my email cleaned out. Now I got four more. So I'm just going to delete them. So somebody emailed me recently. Right? I'm obsessive compulsive that way. Has anybody emailed me from this class? Right? Did I return your email right away? Yeah, you gave me the there you have it. That's a hater. <laughs> Here we go. Watch. In the lining of the lungs, you have cells that are ciliated. So the lining of your respiratory tract is ciliated. You with me? So it has these little extensions of the cell membrane that will actually beat. And you better get this right. Better write this down. They always beat the cilia from the lower airway deep in your lungs to the upper airway, your mouth. So when you're talking to somebody and you say, you know, this class sucks. I'm going to take it at herzing. And you swallow that goob in the back of your throat. That's cilia cleaning your lungs. Tell me you got that. Cigarette smoking. Who smokes in here? No one's willing to admit it? Vape. You what? Vape. Oh, you vaporize? What? It's called vaping. 
Oh, is that with that little box thing? Oh, I thought you were vaporizing something else. <laughs> yeah, watch. Smoking cigarettes paralyzes cilia. So if your toilet gets stuck up, what do you got to do? You got to plunge it. You got me? So people who smoke Marlboro Light, Menthol 100s in a box and they rolled it up in their sleeve, if they've been smoking that for 20 years, they have the smoker's cough, right? They're hacking up loogies because the cilia don't work, so they have to plunge their lungs. And the only way to plunge your lungs is to cough. And I hear it all the time. Watch. People say, I quit smoking and I started coughing more, right? And the reason you do that is that you're actually cleaning out that gook in your lungs because the cilia are coming back to life like Don Gatto. In a couple of weeks after you cleaned them out, you ain't going to cough anymore. Tell me you followed that. Here's the other thing. Watch. About every fifth or sixth ciliated cell, you have a cell called a goblet cell. Gobble, gobble. And goblet cells secrete mucus. And that mucus rides on the cilia like the silver surfer. So when you, is there bad stuff in the air? Pull my finger. <laughs> Can I tell you what the worst? C. diff. That's just the worst, man. That and GI bleed. What is? Yeah, I, I, I'll give you that. I'm going to tell you, this, this is probably the best thing you're ever going to learn in this class. This, this is good advice. If you know a GI bleed's coming in and they're actively bleeding, get some Vicks and just put it here and then rub it in your nostrils, right? That's the word. You will never forget the smell of a GI bleed. <laughs> Where you're bleeding in your intestines, and it's usually people who are in liver failure, and I'll, when we get there, I'll explain why. But that's how uh, people with, in liver failure die. They die either from GI bleed or hepatic encephalopathy. What? Oh, C. diff? Uh, that's a bacteria that you shouldn't be having a lot of in your colon. And if you got like immunocompromised or on heavy duty antibiotics, old people get it, right? This bacteria starts colonizing in your colon. And when that crap comes out, it is just wretched. Yeah. It's like green, yellow turds. Like, it's just a mess. It doesn't. It's just awful. My nephew, my human turd for a nephew, he's got that. So he comes over to my house. I have a bathroom down my basement. And he dumps in my bathroom upstairs in the wintertime. <laughs> Anyways, watch. Watch. What's his cell called? Gobble. Yeah, gobble, gobble. You ever hear of uh, cystic fibrosis? Mm -hmm. Do you know what that is? Do you want to know? Mm -hmm. That's beyond the scope of the course. <laughs> Give me some money. Do you want to? Do you want to know what it is? Yes or no? Yeah. I, I'll give me two minutes and I can explain it to you. Okay, watch. You know anybody with cystic fibrosis? Okay, they usually die from uh, respiratory failure. That's how it happens. But here's the thing. Watch. You're not going to believe this. Embedded in the cell membrane of goblet cells are these ion channels. I know. Stuff's coming back. And watch. What do negative and positive charges do? OK. What do opposite people do? Good. I should have used that one first. <laughs> Watch. Embedded in the cell membrane of goblet cells is a protein ion channel called a chloride channel. You with me? Also, you have sodium channels in there. You with me? And people who have cystic fibrosis, their goblet cells don't have chloride channels. Are you with me? In normal people who have chloride channels, when you make mucus, sodium leaves the mucus, and it attracts, our chloride leaves the mucus, the goblet cell goes into the mucus, and the sodium is attracted to it. 
and water will follow sodium by osmosis. You with me? So you add water to your mucus. You got me? Anytime you add water to anything, you thin it out. In people who have cystic fibrosis, there is a genetic lack. They don't make chloride channels. So when they make their mucus, will chloride leave? If chloride doesn't leave, will sodium follow it? And if sodium doesn't leave, you don't get the water to loosen up that mucus. So the mucus tends to be very, very thick. Say yes. Now watch. It just doesn't affect your respiratory system. Any part of your body that makes mucus is affected by cystic fibrosis. So do you make mucus in your GI tract? Yes. So they have problems with constipation, right? The mucus is very thick. It don't wrap around the turd, so the turd don't slide out, right? Reproductive tract, do you make mucus? Yes. So most of the time, with, if it affects a woman, they can't get pregnant. Say yes. And they have problems, you know, all sorts of uh, uh, female problems with that. Tell me you followed that. So there's really nothing you can do other than treat that. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to alter the DNA of goblet cells for people with cystic fibrosis so that they start putting in these chloride channels. Say, so, yeah. And they usually live to the ripe old age of about 35 or 40. How old was she? She developed it later in life. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, there's different. She died when she was like 55. Yeah, there's different mutations of it. There's like 20 different mutations of it. But it usually happens at birth. And then how they, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I was going to get into something, and I'm like, no, then I'll do it later. Tell me you got that. All right, watch. There's other places that you have cilia. Anybody know where it is? No, we just, uh, not cilia. No? Yeah. You have it in the, um, the Texas Roadhouse emblem. <laughs> or if you use your imagination, Ralph Macchio and the Karate Kid. <laughs> you know when he's... Sad when you got to explain it. Watch. Know this. Know this. Are the ovaries connected directly to the fallopian tubes? No. So watch. When a woman ovulates and pops out Egbert here, at the end of the fallopian tubes are cilia. And cilia will start to beat and say, come on, Herman, come on, right? And draw it up into the fallopian tube. Tell me you got that. And Fertilization of an ovum, a woman's egg, occurs in the fallopian tubes. The problem with that is that because they're not connected, that egg may not get into the fallopian tubes. But if you happen to um, bump ugly with a dude, and you get that real aggressive Michael Phelps type sperm swimmer, they can fertilize that egg outside of the reproductive tract. And that egg fertilized may implant itself on the lining, the outside portion of your colon or something, and you get what's called an ectopic pregnancy. So that's how you get an ectopic pregnancy. Say, yeah. See, even though it was kind of stupid, so you, you learn. Uh, it happens quite, uh, quite frequently. And women who have endometriosis uh, have chances of getting um, ectopic pregnancies as well if they get pregnant. No, I don't know what those coils do. They must block the sperm. Do they? Well, they told me to take like maybe have her get pregnant when I was like. <laughs> well, that's the end of that story. <laughs> yeah. Here's the thing. Uh, watch. I don't want to know too much about this stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right? Like the last thing I would ever want to be a, is a doctor is a gynecologist. Right? Or I take that over proctology. 
That's where you study people's butthole? I mean, for real. Like, who says, I want to do that? Listen up. This is true. I was doing an internship in the ICU, right? So um, me and the nurse were uh, looking at the telemetry, right? So you're looking at the EKGs, and all of a sudden this guy's got a nice normal rhythm, and all of a sudden he looks like he's going into VTAC. So she goes, I'll grab the cart, go in there and see how he's doing. So I go, dude, how you doing? Uh, fine. So she comes in with the crash cart, starts turning up the defibrillator, right, ready to, to shock this guy. I said, he's talking to you. <laughs> and I go, what were you doing like 30 seconds ago? I took my blanket and I shook it out. So it produced artifact on the EKG that looked like VTAC. So, and she's ready to charge the thing up. And I'm like, wait a minute, he's talking. People in VTAC don't talk. That's a true story. Right. Right, and if she would have, right. <laughs> I worked with a doctor in that ER, right? Guy came in, he overdosed, right? So he's laying there, and he's okay, right? He's talking and everything. And then this doctor, his name was Dr. Tragus. How I know that? This is your Tragus, right? Anyways. He's trying to intubate him, put a breathing tube down him. I said, he's beating you up. If he could beat you up, he can breathe. That's what I, look. Whether you know it or not, I'm trying to help you, right, for real. And you don't want to be one of those nurses, right, where say, ugh. That ain't right. And you you know the nurse I'm talking about, don't you? Right? You've all experienced one of them. So don't be that way. All right. So we got this, yes? Cilia. All right, good. Hang on. All right. Microvilli. If you get this right, this will be good. Microvilli. Extensions of the cell membrane. And they increase the surface area for absorption. So watch. Here we go. A2. Assuming that these are the same length, which has more surface area, A or 2? Good. And that's exactly how you should say it, A. So these microvilli are extensions of the cell membrane that increase the surface area for absorption. So where you find these, is where, now you can say it. You find them in the intestines, right? Know this, if it wasn't for microvilli in your intestines, your intestines would have to be an extra 45 feet long, right? Where would you put them? You'd have to carry them over your shoulder like a hose. Then you'd have like a, you could get like a little kind of a Gucci bag. This is my intestine holder. <laughs> then you go to a movie, you put it on a seat, right? You're going to watch a movie, and somebody sits on your duodenum. Hey, <laughs> buddy. <laughs> That's so stupid. I hate me too, just so you know. Did I ask this class that, like, you ever think of something stupid you did, and then you flip yourself off? You ever do that? Like you're in your car and you're driving and you think of something stupid you did and you're like, God, I can't believe I did that. And you flip yourself off. See? Somebody did it. I guess women don't do that. Maybe it's just guys. Do you ever have a, you ever go out and have a bout with the bottle and then you go to sleep and you're dreaming that you uh, are drinking water and you can't get enough to drink? You ever had that? I didn't either. I just heard about it. Watch. Hang on. Where is it? Uh, no, it's that I can't touch that heat, and that's a fact. Right? I can't, there's nothing I can do about it. And I told them it's cold in here, but they can't regulate the heat because it's Gateway Technical College. Technology. Look, I'm using my mic.
right, from Guitar Hero. Better write this down. Watch. In the lining of your intestines, specifically the small intestines, yeah? Where is it? This is what a normal lining should look like. It looks kind of like a vacuum hose. Do you got me? This is the lining of someone with Crohn's disease. Now, Crohn's disease is an autoimmune disease where your immune system didn't get the message that said the lining of my GI tract is good for me. So what the immune system does is attack it, destroy it, and it's replaced with scar tissue. Does scar tissue absorb nutrients? No. So people with Crohn's disease, how do they look? Skinny. And watch. When you damage this lining and you replace it with scar tissue, it doesn't have an immune system now. So this part of the intestine can develop infections. So what happens over time with people with Crohn's disease is you've got to start hacking out their intestines. And a lot of them end up with like a colostomy or an ileostomy. You following me? And that's never good. Now, watch. The difference between Crohn's disease and colitis, ulcerative colitis, is ulcerative colitis occurs in the colon, the large intestines, where you don't do a lot of digesting and absorbing. So those people can be tubby. But what they get is it looked like somebody took some sandpaper, rammed it up their butt, and started rubbing on their colon. That's what it is. So these people get blood in their stool. They develop anemia. They can develop infections as well. But Crohn's disease can happen anywhere from your mouth all the way to your butthole. So it can affect anywhere in the GI tract. That's the difference. Say yeah. Yeah, it is. It's not good. A lot of them, they want to survive, and if it's bad enough, they get, what's, uh, they get a central line, and they get what's called TPN, total parenteral nutrition. They get this big bag of lipids, and then they get this yellow bag called a banana bag. You ever seen them in the hospital? Yeah. So that's what they live off of. Can you imagine that? I was uh, going down the elevator, right? And I'm like, God, my back is killing me, right? Then as I get off the elevator, I see this kid who has uh, really severe spina bifida. And he walked, and just taking two steps looking at him, it's like, that's got to hurt so bad. And then I looked at myself, I'm like, my back don't hurt. You know? People always got it a lot worse. Tell me you got that. The other place, you better write this down, I want this. The other place that you find microvilli are also in the kidneys. So the kidneys, when blood is filtered, you've got to bring that stuff back into the blood. So the kidneys are loaded with microvilli. That sounds like milli vanilla. Okay. How are we doing? Good? All right. Let's do flagellum. Ferdinand flagellum. Ferdinand flagellum, you find in only one cell type in the human. What is that? Sperm. sperm. So sperm can move. Now, this is the important piece. Look, what makes up the structural component of the flagellum? Microtubules. What are microtubules made out of? Protein. What are proteins made out of? Good. So, and you learned that proteins are temperature and pH sensitive. Ain't that right? That's why guys have a scrotum. Because in order for the flagellum to maintain their ideal shape, they have to be kept two to three degrees cooler than core body temperature. If they're not, if they're warmed up, it can change the shape of those microtubules, and the sperm don't swim as good. So if a couple wants to have a kid, they go to fertility counseling. The first question the doctor asks them is, do you wear boxers or tidy whities If you wear tidy whities they tell you to go to boxers so that you, they're a little freer, and they're not as closer, close to the core. Say yeah. 
And in some cases, they find that the guy has a low sperm count and they don't swim well. They will actually have kind of underwear that has like a cooling effect to it. So that's no joke. That's true. Say yeah. So uh, that's why some guys um, watch. And I, I didn't know this. When my kid was born, the first thing the doctor did is he counted the fingers and toes and then made sure there were two testicles in the scrotal sac. Because as the kid is developing, the boy, the testicles sit right underneath the kidney, and then they go into the inguinal canal into the scrotal sac, right? So if they're not, and those testicles remain in the core, it will destroy the uh, uh, testicles' ability to produce uh, sperm, and that kid will be sterile. So that's why they have to be descended uh, surgically. See, so, yeah. You got that? All right. Okay, let's see. Centrioles, real simply, I'll get more into it in uh, the advanced class, but the centrioles, all they do is when a cell is dividing, when a cell is about to divide, the centrioles separate the chromosomes. And this is, this is actually kind of cool. One centriole lines up on this pole of the cell, the other lines up on this pole, and then inside your cell, in, inside your nucleus, when the cell is about to divide, you got these uh, chromosomes, right? Remember that? And what the centrioles do is they throw out like a fishing line, each one, whoops, and they will separate the chromosomes. And this is a fact. They can, they can predict based on the length of your uh, these little, they're called telomeres, these little fishing lines, how long you will live. So as these things get shorter, the cell will not be able to divide and the cell is programmed to die. It's called apoptosis. So as you get older, those little fishing lines get shorter. You can't divide the cells as correctly and the cell dies. That's how you die and age. So if you could increase the length of the fishing lines, you could live longer. So just do that. One of the ways you can do that is by reading the textbook. <laughs> Say, yeah. Watch. <laughs> Cancer. One of the ways chemotherapy works is by preventing the centromeres from separating the chromosomes. If you can't separate the chromosomes, the cells can't divide and they die. So that's how chemo one of the ways chemotherapy works. See, every time I go over something, I always give you a clinical application. Ain't that right? Yeah. I'm like, I'm batting like a thousand right now. <laughs> okay. The basal body, that is at the base of the flagellum. And the basal body is uh, someone who really is very nosy. They're a basal body. Basal body is the site of microtubule production. That's where you make the microtubules. And it also provides a little rotary action for that flagellum. Say yaba. You're with me so far. All right, so watch. The nucleolus. That would be a good name for a rock group, don't you think? It's here for nucleolus. The nucleolus is in the nucleus of the cell, and that's where you make ribosomes. Yeah? Now watch. I'm going to explain this. The difference between chromatin and chromosomes. All right? Both chromatin and chromosomes are DNA. It's just in how they're arranged. So let me ask you a question. When you're going to move, what do you do with your stuff? Good. And you label it like dishes or non-read textbooks. <laughs> when you're at home and you're not moving, there's stuff all over the place, right? So watch. When a cell is actively dividing, when a cell is about to divide, right? They're about to move on. 
they take DNA and they package it up into chromosomes. So chromosomes are packaged DNA. And they're only seen when a cell is actively dividing. You follow? So in cells that don't divide, will you ever see chromosomes? No. So watch. Chromatin, on the other hand, is unraveled DNA. It is the DNA that you can start making proteins with. So the only time you see chromosomes again is when a cell is actively dividing. When it's doing what it does, the DNA is in the form of this unraveled DNA, chromatin. Say yes, a tin. OK. Now watch. Since we're on this, I might as well just explain it to you real quick. What does somat mean? Somat. What? Nice. So in the human, humans, we have 23 chromosomes, 23 pairs of chromosomes. Right? You get one pair from mom and one pair from dad or the milkman. Yeah. Now, and there and each chromosome is when they're in chromosomes, each of the DNA is matched up. So on one chromosome, you've got the gene that codes for eye color from your mom, and on the other one, you've got the gene that codes for eye color from your dad. So that's why they're called homologous. They're the same. Say yes. You're, you're following this. So 22 of the chromosomes, the first 22, are what are called somatic chromosomes. They determine your eye color, hair color, how tall you is, how smart you is. Yes? The last one, the 23rd one, determines your sex. You're with me. So do you remember in ninth grade biology? Do you remember that? I, it was like 90 years ago for me, and I remember it. All right? So and then you got. I never know how to do this. So you got the, the Punnett square. Remember that? That was a good one. Women, XX. Men, XY. So what are the odds of you having a boy or a girl? It's 50%, right? So watch. If you get a sperm that's got an X, you're going to get an X from the woman, you're going to have a girl, right? X and Y, boy, X and Y, boy. I think, though, that 52% of the world population is female, right? That means 48% is guys. Because <laughs> if you add those up, it makes 100. Are you writing that down? All right, so watch. So who determines the sex of the child? the guy. The woman determines when the guy will have sex. <laughs> right, you know that's right. <laughs> I, uh, can I tell you the story real quick? Just real quick. I work at this company, right? And there was this young lady there. <clears throat> And she was, she was very attractive. She was probably about 30 years old. Very attractive, right? And I can't walk up to people at the company and say, hey, you, anything wrong with you? Right? They have to come to me. So she worked there for like two years. And we never talked. You know, I just say hi and I just move on. So one Friday, I see her name on the list, right? And I'm like, hmm, what's going on there? So I, I don't know her history. I don't know anything about her. So she comes in, and this is the first thing that she says to me. Her name was Michelle. I said, Michelle, how can I help you? My husband won't have sex with me. So my second question was, how can I help you? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, um, we, got, we got talking about this. And I said, you basically have two choices. You either find another way to get sexual satisfaction, or you leave him. And she goes, he's a keeper. So I said, there's your answer, right? And 
I said, if you step out on him, he'll never forgive that, ever. No man will ever forgive that. They won't. And I often wondered why. Why won't they forgive that? And then I thought about it, and I thought, now I know why. Because watch, watch. When I was younger, and you guys, right, you won't probably say anything, and I don't blame you, but when I was younger, I would, you know, get ready to go out, right, and I'd go, man, I hope I hook up tonight, right? And 99 times out of 100, it never happened. Now, you may or may not want to admit this, but if you go out, you look in the mirror and you go, I'm going to hook up tonight, and it happens, because the woman controls that. And what I'm saying about that is that because guys know how easy it is for a woman to have sex, that's why they'll never forgive it. Guys got to work hard, and it never happens, because women control when guys have sex. <laughs> that's how it works. And <laughs> you know I'm right. And here's the other thing. The biggest reason why a guy will never forgive that, and I'm just telling you this, and it's not good, bad, or indifferent. It's simply a fact that when I was younger, I had sex with women, and I didn't even know their name, and I didn't care, right? And women are the, oh, that's so awful, Tim. Oh, how could you do that? Now, the guys, they won't admit it, but like, I get it. I get it. Where women have sex to express emotion, guys have sex because it's fun. So your guy, if you step out on him, knows that there was something going on with that guy. It wasn't just like, hey, let's go. There was something, there was some emotional tie to that guy. That's why they'll never forgive it. So I go back to women determine when a guy has sex, men determine the sex of the child. Yep. There is? That's what they say. They like what? There are certain positions and different things like That's that. ridiculous. <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's the luck of the draw, man. I mean, honestly. Hey, I have never heard that. And if they can. I, we're getting off the subject here a little bit. <laughs> And I did it, but anyways, watch. I don't know about that, but this, this is a fact. This is a fact. And um, I always come back to uh, Maury and who's your baby's daddy, and here's why. Watch. Um, it has some socially redeeming value. It does. Because when you watch this show, you think to yourself, I ain't that bad. I ain't that crazy. So you know what I mean? My point is, is this, is that when women say, I hope he's not the father, I hope he's not the father, I hope he's not the father. If he's the father, there was some emotional attachment there, and here's why. Women have the ability, this is crazy, it sounds crazy, but they can produce antibodies, things that will destroy things, to a guy's sperm that they don't have an emotional connection with. That's a fact. So when women are more and who's your baby dad, I hope he's not the father, they, they want, there's, if they're the father, there was an emotional attachment there. There was. And there's nothing you can do about it. And here's the other, here's the other thing, well, since we're on it, just real quick. How do we get on this? Well, then just stop. Stop me. Say, so, yeah, you're off track. When a woman is ovulating, that's when they want to have sex, right? Biologically, it makes sense. So to kind of ensure that a woman will get pregnant, a woman will increase the production of mucus in their uterus and their cervix, and they will actually have like these protein ropes in their mucus that will allow the sperm to actually kind of hang on and move into the fallopian tube easier to get them pregnant. Kind of like a little, I don't know, what do they call it? A little pole thing on a ski, right? So, okay, here I go. That's a fact. Right? So, I mean, look, this stuff has been around for a million, you know, a gazillion years. And, uh, 
It works most days. Say, uh, so those are like the cilia? Is that what you're no, the, they're actually like a little protein strand no, that. Oh, over here? Right here? Yeah. No, no, no. Those are, uh, those are fornices. That's where they get the word fornication. There's little indentations here. So when a guy ejaculates into the vaginal vault, it doesn't drip out. It falls into these recesses. You follow? And this is a fact, too. And look, this is AMP class, right? The uterus is made of muscle, and muscle can do two things, contract and relax, right? So a woman is more likely to have, uh, get pregnant if they have an orgasm during sex because when they have an orgasm, the, the cervix starts contracting back and forth and actually works like a suction cup to suck the semen into the uterus. I'm not making this up, right? But after class, I'm going to go to the Texas Roadhouse. <laughs> Give me some wings. <laughs> I hate me too, just so you know. All right. Hang on. Where are we? Here we go. Okay, watch. The last one I want to talk about is uh, the secretory vesicle. The secretory vesicle is really part of the membrane of the Golgi apparatus. So when a cell has to move something big into or out of the cell, in this case, out of the cell, whatever that product is, it's going to wrap a membrane around the Golgi, or around, uh, the Golgi apparatus membrane is going to wrap around that product, and then it's going to bind to the cell membrane, yes, and then it's going to spit it out into the blood. So secretory vesicles are transport ves uh, vesicles for big stuff, big stuff, yes? And then, is there bad stuff in the cell? Can bad stuff get in there? Yeah. So in the cell, you have these little things called lysosomes. Lysosomes, what does the name lysosomes sound like? Lysol. Lysol. So lysosomes are kind of the garbage men of the cell. They will go around and they will scavenge for potential harmful chemicals, bacteria, and they will get in there and they will destroy that stuff. Say yeah. So they get rid of potential harmful stuff that's in the cell. Now, this isn't part of your deal, so just, just uh, listen to this. You wouldn't know this, so I'm going to have to tell you. I'll ask the question, then I'll wait, and then I'll just tell you. When you eat something and it gets digested and absorbed into your bloodstream, where does it go to first? What organ does all of the stuff that you eat go through first? No, after you digest it and absorb it into the blood. It goes to the liver. So the liver handles all of the blood from your GI tract. You got me? You're with me. Let me just show you. Wait till you hit 50, man. You got to get a colonoscopy. That is like, wow. I'll tell you, man, that verse said, though, they could bottle that stuff. Three years ago, I had a hernia repair, right? So I come out of surgery, and they gave me the verse said, right? So I come out, right? And then it's like you have no inhibition at all. This nurse, she's taking my blood pressure. I go, hey, what are you doing? And she goes, I'm taking your blood. I go, you want to go out tonight? And she goes, I don't think you're going to be in any shape. No, I feel good. This stuff is good. Anyways, watch. All of everything that you put into your mouth that gets digested and absorbed into the blood, it has to go through the liver first before it gets dumped into the general circulation. Are you following me? All right, you don't know this yet, but I'm, since I got it up here, I'm going to explain it to you. There's no pressure in the veins, the venous system, right? So all of these are veins. You got me? 
And because there's no pressure in the veins, the walls of the veins are very, very thin and weak. Are you with me? So if you have liver failure, your liver is damaged. So the GI tract is going to try to send all of the blood that it used to to the liver, but it can't because your liver's jacked up. Tell me you got that. You're with me. So where did the blood in the liver come from? The GI tract. So if the liver is failing, where's the blood going to back up into? The GI tract. And because there's, those veins aren't used to handling pressure, those veins will start to balloon out. And if you get these ballooned out veins in your rectum, you get hemorrhoids. And if they burst, you get GI bleed. That's how people with liver failure and why they get GI bleed. Say, yeah. Tell me you followed that. So any, anyone over the age of 40 who has a bout with the bottle on a regular got hemorrhoids. It's guaranteed. Not me, because I teach at a technical college. I stayed at a Holiday Inn. So that's how they die. They die from GI bleed. Yep. They got hemorrhoids. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Pregnant women get hemorrhoids, and I'll, I ain't got time for that. But tell me you followed that. Yeah? When we get to the digestive system, I'm gonna, uh, I'll tell you a story uh, about Barry, um, this guy named Barry. Guy was, he was a good dude. Ended up dying. That's never a good way to end a story, huh? All right. So let's see. Lysosome. Did I do them all? I did them all, right? Okay, that's what I want. Watch. I'm going to give you the blank cell diagram. Yep. You're going to label it. You're going to give me a brief description of each part of the cell. Because I like you guys, I put all of this on a little video that says explanation of the cell and explanation of each part of the cell. Wasn't that nice of me? Anybody watch that vid video? Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to do one more thing tonight, and then you can ambulate home. Okay? How many people plan on ambulating home? All right. You can actually walk home? Okay. How many people plan on coming on Saturday? Yeah, make sure you do. 9 o'clock, S125 Kenosha. Right? All right. Okay, hang on. Here we go. Mm. All right, let me just show you this. If you get this right, I will give you, if somebody gets this right, somebody, I will give you an extra 20 points on your first quiz. Yeah. Right, and watch, watch now. Before it was, <laughs> if I made everything extra credit, you guys would be like brain surgeons in a week. It's so funny, man, right? I got a 3% on the test, but I got the extra credit right. Okay, watch. What determines the type of cell that you are. What ultimately determines the type of cell that that cell is? Ultimately. No, he said DNA and I said ultimately. Say what? What? Just went over it. No, now it's a flight of ideas. You're just saying words. Come on. 
I told you it's really, really important. Tattoo it. Never forget it. Come on. Yep, that's not it though. <laughs> yeah, right, right. But right, but uh, you're right. That's good. But okay, no, I'm not going to give you a hint. It's worth 20 extra credit points. That's another flight of idea there. Come on, for real? Uh, no. Go ahead, just, yeah, just keep, yeah, yeah. yeah. Walmart, TV, we'll get there. Yeah, <laughs> come on. Wow, I'm not telling you. I'm not. For real? What did you say? <laughs> what receptors? Yeah, so what are you trying to tell me? Like what a liver cell and a kidney cell tell me. That's right. Did you follow that? Mm -hmm. Different cells have different receptors. So that means, look, I, that was the first thing we started with, mm -hmm. right? But that was an hour ago, so, yep, forget about that. <laughs> so watch. Because different cells have different receptors different chemicals from the blood are going to be able to bind to those receptors because shape of chemical and receptor determine that. So that's what ultimately determines what a cell is. The receptors embedded in the cell membrane. Tell me you got that. And what are these receptors mostly made out of? Protein. And what does DNA tell your cell how to put together? proteins. So only sections of DNA that code for liver proteins are ever going to be turned on by a liver cell. Say yes. So watch. If you have a chemical that can be measured in the blood and it is higher than normal, right? Normally whatever cell produces that or whatever gland produces that, it shouldn't be producing that high of a level. So should a lung cell ever produce a hormone produced by the pituitary gland? Good. So in people with lung cancer, because in cancer, different genes are activated, they will produce a hormone that's produced by your pituitary gland. That's how from a blood test, they can tell if somebody's got lung cancer. Say, yeah, that's abnormal. You don't want that. So. On your list of things to do, read the textbook. Don't get chemicals in your blood that shouldn't be there. I'm going to write that down. All right. I'm going to run through this. I made a video of this, what I'm about to explain to you. This is on quiz number two. Understand that. We're done with quiz number one. All the stuff that I'm going over is on quiz number two. One of the questions on quiz number two is, Identify and give a brief explanation of each part of the cell. Did I just do that? Bam. There's another question. It says, how does a cell make a protein? Are you with me? I made a video for that, but now I'm going to explain it to you. Say yes. This question, how a cell makes a protein, 150 big ones and no little ones. Say yeah. So watch, because I ain't going to remember. Two seconds after somebody tells me, it's gone. I'm a guy. On quiz number one, you're going to write on the top of your test, plus 20. If you don't write that, I'm not going to give it to you. You understand? Say yeah. So everybody's writing that down. I imagine some people going home, taking a pen, and cutting it into their forearm so that they remember plus 20. Say yeah. OK. Here we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use insulin as an example. 
And I want this whole thing. You got me? All right. Whole thing. Starting. Right now. What kind of cell is this? How do you know? Good. See, we're moving. Does the pancreatic cell have a nucleus? Does it contain DNA? Good. What's the only sections of DNA that a pancreatic cell is going to activate? Genes that code for pancreatic proteins. Say yes. How does a pancreatic cell know that it has to make insulin? You're not going to believe this. Kind of making this up, but not really. Embedded in a pancreatic cell membrane is a little receptor called a glucoreceptor. What do glucoreceptors recept? Right. Otherwise, it'd been an insulo receptor. Glucoreceptor. You got me? All right. So watch. When do you need to have insulin? See how this works? When your blood sugar is high. So here, here's your blood sugar at 80. What up, G? Yeah? Then you eat some what? Snicker bar. Yeah. You know what I had? I had a Butterfinger yesterday. I had a Butterfinger this morning, too. It was the same Butterfinger. That stuff gets all in your teeth, man, for like weeks, man. You got to get like a little chisel. It's a mess. So you eat Butterfinger. What's going to happen to your blood sugar? How would you know it went up? Because I put an extra G in there. <laughs> when your blood sugar goes up, that excess glucose is going to bind to glucoreceptors on a pancreatic cell. What's the only cell that makes insulin? So what's the only cell that's got a glucoreceptor? See how this works? And when you bind that excess glucose in a pancreatic cell, it is going to send a message to the DNA to begin the process of making the protein insulin. Are you following that? I want this whole thing. Here we go. Now watch. We talked about this. We talked about the fact that DNA is in a double helix. Did we not? We talked about yes or no? Good. And what are the four nucleic acids that make up DNA? That's right. So I went over it. God bless Timmy. All right, hang on. I don't like that one. I don't like that one. What do I like? Here. There we go. Wait, I don't like that one either. Wait, hang on. Oh, did I do that? Okay, wait, wait, wait. Here we go, here we go. Oh, that ain't it. Oh, I had this all set up. Oh, I had to probably show you cilia. Did I? No. All right, hang on. Oh, crud. I was doing so good, too. All right, here we go. All right, let's watch this stuff. Uh, fans love protein stuff, bars and shakes. All right, that's good. Drink that. Oh, that's good. You can tell by her face. She really enjoyed that. Here we go. Watch. I want this. DNA is in a double helix, right? And remember, there's adenine, and adenine always pairs with thymine and guanine always pairs with cytosine right so how you think of it is at gateway college good you should give me money for that are you are you with me guys okay so these little things here and I'll show you a little better these are the nucleic acids and again the reason DNA is in a double helix is to promote its stability, right? 
So you got two, you got two, I don't know, what do they call them? Sides of a ladder, and then the rungs of the ladder are the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's binding together. Are you with me, guys? So watch. When the DNA is in a double helix, it's stable. But in order to get at the gene that codes for the protein insulin, you have to break the bonds between the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's. Are you with me? And this is the important piece. This is the important piece. What tells the cell, what tells that pancreatic cell that you need to activate the gene on the DNA that codes for the protein insulin? That's nice. Tell me you got that. So what you have to do is when that receptor is stimulated, it's going to tell the DNA, and it's actually lighting up, and we'll have like little lines on it. It will tell the DNA to unzip at the exact spot that codes for that protein insulin. Are you, are you with me? So watch. I'll show you. Here we go. Is it, that in here? Where did I put that thing? So watch. Where the hell did I put it? Oh, here we go. Okay. So watch. You got to break the bonds between those nucleic acids, A, T, Cs, and Gs. And there is a enzyme that comes in, and that enzyme, remember, chemical reactions, it breaks the bonds between the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's, and that enzyme is called helicase. Most things with ACE after it are an enzyme or a pet detective. I have something to tell you. <laughs> so watch. That enzyme is going to break the bonds between the A's, the T's, the C's, and the G's and reveal the gene, the section of DNA that codes for the protein insulin. So here comes the pickle. It's going to find the spot that codes on that big, long chain of DNA that codes for all the proteins in the body. It's going to find the exact spot that codes for the protein insulin and unravel the DNA. Are you with me so far? Now, the only spot that is unraveled is the spot that codes for the protein insulin. It wouldn't make sense to unravel the entire chain of DNA and leave all that DNA open where it could be damaged. Say yes. Now look, better write this down, better not pout. DNA never leaves the nucleus. Where do you put together the protein inside the cell? Right, the rough endoplasmic reticulum ribosome. That's outside of the nucleus. Say yes. So. What happens is that you have to copy that DNA. And what copies the DNA? Anybody know? It's called messenger RNA. I'm not even going to distinguish between the difference between RNA and DNA. Don't worry about it. You got me? Now watch. Here's the section of DNA that codes for the protein insulin. Does DNA ever leave the cell? What's this strand for? This strand of DNA. What's its function? It is garbage. It doesn't code for anything. It is only useful to keep the DNA from being damaged. This portion of the DNA tells the cell how to put together all the uh, proteins in your body. You got me? This is just for stability. But in order to get that, that DNA that codes for that protein, you got to break the bonds between that double helix. How many people are following me? Yeah? OK, here we go. And if you read this in chapter 4, I think it's in chapter 4, you're going to realize that I am simplifying this immensely. But that's what I get paid for. Not really. But here we go. Watch. I'm making this up. I'm making this up. This is the sequence for 
uh, insulin in their DNA. It's cytosine, 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 guanine, thymine, adenine, thymine, guanine. That's the DNA. This is the DNA, right? Messenger RNA now has to copy that. Are you following me? Now watch. And people are probably looking at this like, oh my God, this is so complicated. It's not. Trust me. All you have to do is learn it and study it. That's why you came to school. I had some students in my day class, well, Tim, I studied. I go, I fed my kid today. Should I get credit for that? Right? You're supposed to feed your kid. You should write that down. Just like when you're in school, you're supposed to study. You should write that down. So watch. So this is DNA. What's going to be the corresponding matching base pair for messenger RNA? C always matches with G. C always matches with G. C always matches with G. G always matches with C. T always matches with A. A always matches with E. You've been tricked. Better write this down. The only place that you find the nucleic acid thiamine is in DNA. Where's messenger RNA going to go? Where do you put together the protein? In the ribosome. So in messenger RNA, thiamine is replaced with a more stable nucleic acid called uracil. You probably read that in your book. You didn't read that in your book? Oh. If you would have read that in your book, you would have read that. So A matches with T. Whoops. A matches with U, uracil. T still matches with A, and G matches with C. So now what you have done is you have made a strand of messenger RNA. Messenger RNA now holds the genetic code to put together insulin. I'm just going for it. Again, you don't learn anything in this class. You just collect information and go home and study it. All right, so watch. If you come in for your first quiz and you weren't prepared because you, um, I don't know, doing something, and you start copying somebody, what's that called? Yeah. What's the big word? We're talking about DNA here. I, um, yep, that was bad. I'll just tell you. When you copy something, you transcribe it. So watch. When you copy DNA, when messenger RNA copies DNA, that's called transcription, right? Copying is called transcribing. So you could say to me, Tim, I wasn't copying their answer. I was transcribing it. And I'll say, oh, OK. So watch. Messenger RNA transcribes it. What, you better get this, what's DNA and messenger RNA made out of? What's the building blocks? Uh, ooh. Now, who said that? Say it real loud, proud. Nucleic, acid. Nucleic acids. Right? What are proteins made out of? Beautiful. That's beautiful. So watch. If you have a book that's in English and you want to convert it to Spanish, what do you have to do? You have to translate it. Say yes. So. When you build this protein, you have to convert nucleic acids. I spelt that wrong. That's my dyslexia. Nucleic acids to amino acids. Say yeah. Are you following me? All right, so watch. Where do you physically put together the protein? The ribosome. Where's messenger RNA and DNA? 
in the nucleus. So watch. When messenger RNA copies the DNA, and then the little pickle binds those nucleic acids together, so you're making this strand of messenger RNA. You got me? Guys? The messenger RNA detaches from the DNA and then heads to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, right? In this video, you'll actually see them wave goodbye. Watch, the messenger RNA will wave goodbye. It will. Look. Not showing, see it wave? In one video, the messenger RNA gives the DNA the finger. So watch. The messenger RNA now has the genetic code to make the protein insulin. Where do you physically put together the amino acids to make the protein? The ribosome. So the messenger RNA gets grabbed by a ribosome. And in this video, the ribosome looks like a piece of toasted pita bread with a slit down the middle. So that's a ribosome. You got me? And it grabs it. Now watch. I want this. The job of the ribosome is to read, like a little ticker tape, read the messenger RNA. Three nucleic acids at a time. This is the hard part where people don't get it, and you're going to get this. We're out in the rough endoplasmic reticulum right now. You got me? So watch. Floating out in the cytoplasm of all of your cells are these three nucleic acid compounds chemically bonded together and connected to those three nucleic acid compounds is one of the 21 individual amino acids. So watch. Thiamine, bye-bye. Wherever there was thiamine, it's now uracil. This guy right here, which is a chain of three nucleic acids chemically bonded together, excuse me, and attached to it, is one of the 21 individual amino acids. This guy right here is called transfer RNA or tRNA. Now watch, I'm making this up. And I know I'm getting looks, so I'm not going to look. I'm just going to do it. Watch. This sequence of transfer RNA, say it's C, C, U. And that has amino acid 8 connected to it. Are you with me? Then you have another. You've got a bunch of these transfer RNA floating out in the cytoplasm. Yeah? You got another transfer RNA, and this is G C A. What amino acid is not going to be connected to this? Eight. Because that sequence of transfer RNA will determine which amino acid is connected to it. Do you see this? Do you see it? All right. So watch. What's the job of the ribosome? to read this messenger RNA, three nucleic acids at a time. What's floating out in the cytoplasm? Transfer RNA. And connected to the transfer RNA is one of the 21 individual amino acids. What happened? Oh, God. What happened? Here we go. Watch. Here comes transfer RNA coming in. Here it comes. Is it coming? Watch. Watch. Here's messenger RNA. The sequence is U, C, G. What's going to be the corresponding transfer RNA that's going to match up? A, G, C. And that is going to correspond to one of the 21 individual amino acids. Tell me you got that. You're following this. You will. You'll study it and do really good. I believe in you all. You got me? Hang on, what happened? There we go. What happened? All right, here we go. Now watch. 
What's the job of the ribosome? The job of the ribosome is to move down the messenger RNA, three nucleic acids at a time, connected to the messenger RNA. Our, the transfer RNA is one of the 21 individual amino acids. Yes? So this is an individual amino acid, this one. And then they get chemically bonded together. What's a protein? Amino acids chemically bonded together. And when you make a protein, a gold pickle binds them together and you flash, you glisten. So once you've done that, then the ribosome moves down the messenger RNA again, three nucleic acids at a time, and another transfer RNA is going to come in. How many people are with me, guys? And then based on that sequence of messenger RNA, okay, so watch, watch. This guy right here, this is messenger RNA, and I'm making this up. C, G, A. What's the corresponding transfer RNA? G, C, It's kind of like swearing. G, T, C, U. U, no thiamine there. So when they match up, that's going to correspond to one of the 21 individual amino acids. Say yes. Okay. And that process continues until you've gone through the entire strand of messenger RNA. Each time the, the gold pickle binds those amino acids together. Now watch. This, what appears to be a green turd coming out of a house, is your protein. Now watch. Your protein are made of individual amino acids chemically bonded together. And each one of them carries a negative, positive, making this up. Say yes. And when you put together the amino acids, the charges are going to interact, and that protein is going to have a particular shape. And the shape of that protein determines its function. Say yes. 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 OK, watch. 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 And then we're done. You can ambulate home. Where do you make the protein? In the cell. Ribosome. So watch. What are you going to do? You're going to put together the protein insulin. Insulin, once it's formed, goes to the Golgi apparatus. It's packaged in a secretory vesicle. It binds to the cell membrane. Watch it. Who's watching? And through the process of exocytosis, insulin gets dumped into the blood. Watch it. Insulin will circulate in the blood. Uh-oh. Why was insulin in your blood? Your blood sugar was high. Here's a cell. Insulin's going to bind to that insulin receptor. It's going to open up that gate and allow what up G to go from high concentration in the blood to low concentration in the cell. Watch. Then, when your blood sugar gets back to normal, there's no longer excess glucose stimulating that receptor. So that gene is turned off and insulin production stops. Yes or no? All right. That's how a cell makes a protein. I want that whole thing. What's that? Yeah. 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 This is, uh, this is where people, uh, they think about this class and they think, I wonder if there's any openings in horticulture. <laughs> it is what it is, guys. And if you read the chapter, if you actually, I'd love you to go read the chapter, right? And then, um, oh, wait, what did I do? <laughs>